So, what's in the box? This here is the OG 30% mechanical keyboard. Literally, absolutely nothing electric about this machine. In fact, this machine was first produced between 1910 to 1913. Well, the original junior model coming out in 1907, so this machine's about like 110 years old. Um, so, as you can see here, you have your 28 letter and character keys, interestingly positioned spacebar over here, two shift keys, which basically in this case access also uh, your figures or so caps for capitals and figs for your last layer of numbers and symbols. So, yeah, these machines here with their figs and caps pretty much were an early implementation of the layers used in modern small profile keyboards. Um, and in terms of, yeah, this whole total letter count or key count of uh, 31 just over here, you could also potentially include this key, which is basically your, your original enter key, in this case your line advance, and carriage return. And yeah, this machine does not have arrow keys, instead you move the carriage left and right manually on this particular machine, or you turn the platinum knob in order to allow the paper to be fed. Um, yep, so, you know, this being a typewriter, you didn't have a screen, you instead had paper. So, to do that, you would just stick this in, pull, roll up the platinum knob, lift the paper bale, and if things go well, it will behave, hopefully. then you'll be ready to type. I did re-ink this ribbon at one point, but now it's all dry. Uh, not the best uh, stamp ink or water-based ink, so it doesn't really last very long. Um, but yeah, at least for a time it did type. That was a few months ago, and I will be posting separately the speed typing footage on this machine, back when I was a lot more practiced with this. Um, so pretty much what this machine is, is what you call a single element typewriter where instead of having a lot of bars, like, I guess this time I'll use the boss as an example. Um, don't mind the mechanical keyboards. <laughs> um, where again, you have all of your characters on individual type bars, and for each key that you press, one of these type bars will fly. This design inherently allows for a much faster performance and operation, but of course at the cost of a lot more parts. So these single element typewriters, like the Blickensturfer, which I presented in my previous video, or the Mignon over here in the video before that, um, were all designed to use this single element type cylinder, or a single part that contains all of the characters on it, and is simply rotated in order to present the correct character onto the page, in order to save on the number of parts that need to be manufactured, and hence the cost of the typewriter, allowing these typewriters to be appreciated and enjoyed and used within the household of those who could not afford the full standard typewriters. Um, okay, I guess technically, fortunately today, I have this example here of the Harris Visible, as well as my trusty Underwood number no. 5, and a much later facet. So those are standard typewriters, which were typically only really used 
in business office settings and only made their way into the household secondhand, where they would be, number one, quote-unquote, outdated, mainly in appearance, really, um, in style. Otherwise, basically functioning or having very similar features and also performing fairly similarly. Um, and, of course, then attainable for a much lower cost. So, as you already saw, key press. And with each key press, like on the Blickensturfer here, we have this cylinder, which gets rotated and presents the appropriate character. Then, if you want to access more characters, like the capitals, or numbers and symbols, you press these two keys, which are equivalent to these here, figs and cap, um, figs and cap, or if you want to go into a much older machine, uh, figs, cap. <laughs> this guy is a lot more pricey and rare than these three machines. Um, then that basically just lifts the cylinder so you can access a particular row of characters. Same deal on the Hammond here. Now, as for how that works under the hood, you can simply unscrew or just loosen the side screws. And again, you can see here, this machine is quite short. Uh, just about maybe one and three quarters of an inch, um, which is indeed shorter than, say, a console Comet ultra portable typewriter, though maybe not as short as a Gromina by Groma, which produced um, also the Groma Calibri ultra portable. Anyways, once you've done that, this thing here comes off keyboard, and you can see here the mechanism. Um, yeah, so as you can see, this machine isn't in the best cosmetic condition. Lots of rust and wear, but it technically works almost perfectly. I mean, like it types, but could probably type smoother if it were in better condition. But everything's working. It's basically complete. Um, yeah, these springs here were missing. So I had to replace them, and um, yeah, I was only able to get these off of a RC, um, the antenna from an old RC boat that I had, so I just cut that up. It happened to be made of spring steel, which is what you need for these, otherwise the metal will be too malleable and not be able to hold its springy force delivering capabilities. So it's nice that I was able to get this to work, though it doesn't yield the exact same properties because it's so thick and the thick gauge doesn't fit as well into the little holes into which the ends are mounted. Um, I did have to do a fair bit of tweaking to make sure that the force delivered by all of these uh, key, uh, springs on these keys was enough. Um, so generally the idea is that if you press a key one of the keys behind it should not also end up falling. So you have to make sure that you have all that nice stuff. Cool stuff. You might also find it a bit weird that when you press one of the keys behind, it causes all of the other keys in front of it to fall, but that's kind of inherent to the design. And to an extent, it actually helps make some space um, for your fingers, because you kind of don't technically don't want your fingers to have to dig in behind the front two. Um, so now, looking down to this design here, you can see that the caps and figs, they basically just push on different parts, or rather allow... yeah, yeah. So the caps, these both um, push on the same lever, but the figs key is able to push even further. 
this here being the caps lock, which just uses a simple uh, notch. So back in the days, he had to pretty much have a mechanical mechanism to physically hold the shift in place. And that lever here, via this point, is what pushes up this type cylinder by the perfect amount, and just like on the Blickensturfer, it is removable, as you can see. That shows you a bit more to the mechanism, where you have the sector gear and a pinion, as well as a slider. Um, I guess, yeah, all the actual pushing is done from this end. Things. So, that easily goes back on. Of course, you have to make sure that you put it in the right way. I'm gonna guess right now <laughs> that I haven't made a mistake. Maybe that little dot over there acts as a guide. Um, yeah, when I received this machine, this particular spring wasn't linked, so I had to put that back. I was also quite easily able to uh, get this to a bit of a decent polish just by wiping it with some liquid wrench and paper towel. And this bell here also had to be, uh, or the bell striker had to be bent, so that it would actually make a sound. If I can get it to strike, there you go. So basically the carrot is just moving over this little tab, lifting it, and then releasing it. You have to adjust that so that the resting position is just slightly above the bell so that when it is dropped it will strike very quickly and then rebound out of the way to allow the bell to resonate, else you'll just get a really dull sound. So also another issue was that this part of the back of the machine was bent a bit this way, so I was able to easily fix that bend. And after applying, again, a lot more of this liquid wrench stuff, which I um, swear by, I was able to get the carriage moving nice and freely. I think I also had to unbend some issues at the back here with this little slot. Yep, so that's all moving nicely. Now, the interesting thing is that with the very simple escapement design on this machine. The carriage is constantly on a quote-unquote carriage release mode, whereas on this machine and the Mignon, um, the escapement keeps it locked in both directions, unlike on a regular Type R typewriter, where you can pull it in one direction but then you have to type to get it to move in the other direction, or use the carriage release. So yeah, here you need to use the carriage release if you want to move it either left or right, or you can hold down on the spacebar to achieve the same. To achieve the same. Yeah, it's always fun doing that. So, um, all typewriters have the essential function of moving the carriage along every single time you press a key, so that basically you can move the quote-unquote cursor to imprint the next character, right? Otherwise you'll have all of your characters uh, piling up or having bad alignment. So each different typewriter has its own mechanism. In this case, for the Bennett, it has a very simple design. Now, what you see here is that I'm hitting the left margin to get out of that, or also, in this case, you have these notches here, which allow you to select the location of your left margin. Most typewriters have a variable position, whereas this Bennett has a fixed position for those margins. So, like here, or here, or here. Or if you want to remove the carriage, you just lift it completely, and pull it out from any direction. In this case, I'll pull it from the right. 
and that will allow you to do whatever, whatever you wish. You know, just examine, clean things. Um, yeah, this machine still has reasonably round feed rollers, which are essential to allowing the paper to be smoothly pulled through the platen. Platen being this black rubber roller, which has now um, gone, gone all hard after 100 years of existing. Um, I did also have to replace a little spring in here for the paper bale. I just bent my own design. It works. Anyways, given that, you can see here that whenever you press a key, this will be pushed, and this in turn pushes a very simple pole over there. Which, via some special linkages and things it collides with, allows it to introduce that little tip and then push to the left. In that case, that interacts with this rack on the carriage and allows the carriage to move to the left space by space. Now, in terms of how we get from an actual key press to the indexing of which of these many symbols on this type cylinder to impart onto the paper. Basically, when you press a key, you have a whole bunch of levers here, which present tabs. Um, in this case, it's actually, well, I'll show that later, but pretty much what's happening is these tabs, when you press them, will engage with one of these slots here on either side. Depending on which one you push, the this rack here and hence the type cylinder will either move to the left or right. In the case of the Blickensturfer, uh, yeah, similar idea. It will rotate this way if you press on this side, rotate the other way if you press on the right side. Also, same idea for the Hammond, though kind of the opposite because of the way it's designed. I'll cover that in detail in the next video. Um, so, yeah, given that, that just shows how everything is actuated. You push on one of these levers, it pushes on one of these sides that move these linkages, which turns the sector gear which turns your type cylinder, which moves your rack here, which we will learn the importance of soon. And as we already saw, also actuates that escapement pole, which moves the carriage to the left. So now it would actually in fact be easier to see this on operation with the carriage removed, like so. So now turned around, you'll be able to see that when you press a key, it pushes uh, on one of those, and now we can see the, the significance of that rack, and it's being moved to the to either side. The purpose of that rack is to be stopped by one of these tabs which are being presented. So these tabs are basically specifying at what point this cylinder should stop rotating, and hence the point at which the correct character is presented. Um, yeah. Yeah, I did re-ink this ribbon, but it seems like that ink has already deteriorated, so I definitely have to replace this ribbon. Um, instead of trying to re-ink it again, but, um, yeah, so, same thing on the other side, you press a key, the lever is presented, pushes on the mechanism, which leads to the 
type cylinder being rotated and then it's rotating and well sliding that rack until it gets stopped and with the way the mechanism is designed even when that is stopped it will still move the type cylinder forward until it strikes the platen. In this case we have two pins, one pin on the bottom and one on the top, which interacts with these holes in the type cylinder in order to maintain the alignment. Though as I found on my machine there are some issues with said mating of the alignment hole with the P and Q keys on the flanks. Um, so like sometimes I find that the Q or the capital Q might not properly mate unless I press it hard or I press it slow. Um, in this case, I'd say the Blickensturfer has a slightly more reliable system where it uses the gear and a tab instead, like so, to maintain alignment. So that's how you, that's how this mechanical keyboard, completely mechanically, goes from a key press to the imparting of a character onto the page. And I guess the last interesting mechanism is how the ribbon advance works. So basically you have these spools. Um, to actually remove one of the spools, you can do this. Um, I think it was this one where the spool had originally been completely rusted and hence unable to turn, which was quite unfortunate. I did eventually managed to use heat and a sufficient amount of torque delivered with the pliers to get it loose. So now it works nicely. That goes back on. Well, if you want to see what it looks like. This guy here is responsible, this little pole is what is responsible for actually turning this ribbon. Because basically this ribbon is impregnated with ink. And every single time you type, you want a different part of that ribbon to be presented between the type cylinder and the paper, else that part of the ribbon will just get dry from being used so many times. So, in this case, what happens is that when you press a key, uh, right, let's turn this around. We have this little roller over here, and that pushes against this surface, which then in turn turns said little pawls. Like so. Um, yeah, in this case, the springs and the locking tabs. So here, this spring here, where the detent is broken, while it's still intact on the other side. But it still works for both ribbon directions, maybe just not perfectly. At the same time, one of the springs right here is broken, um, such that it will only work if you have gravity pulling it down. Yeah, in this case that side is currently not being engaged. It's the other side, which is able to advance the ribbon. And from the top of the machine you would basically just flip this. So pretty much if you reach the end of one of your spools, um, on these older machines which don't have what you call an automatic ribbon reverse, then you would have to manually flip the switch, which will then put the other spool into engagement and have that one rotating instead. So now the ribbon is moving the other direction. Alright, so that's it for the Bennett typewriter and how it works. I will be posting shortly uh, some technically older footage of 
me speed typing on this machine. Um, in terms of uh, the actual performance limitations of this typewriter, it does in fact type just about no faster than the Blickmansdurfer, which I limit to between 5 to 6 characters per second. Um, technically, yeah, so this machine, I've already mentioned in the previous video the limitations with how you're kind of forced to press completely and release completely if it is to reliably index to the next character in rapid succession. While I did suppose that at least this machine could potentially be more efficient in its indexing design and be capable of indexing more quickly, but I guess in practice it turns out that just with all the parts that are moving and interacting, if you try typing too fast, you'll just end up getting a lot of uh, scratching and screeching and just horridness and sounds you definitely don't want to hear in a typewriter. So, yeah, I wouldn't recommend trying to type any faster than 5 to 6 characters per second, which is a decent rate, but, yeah, compared to manual typewriters, which can reach upwards of, well, the type bar typewriters, which can type for upwards of 14 characters per second. Um, yeah, these machines are quite slow, but again, inexpensive. Then, in terms of the actual key feel, I'll describe it as being fairly springy, much like on the Blickensurfer, but with its own set of little tactile vents. First of all, the one resulting from the play between your pressing the key and it's actually hitting and pushing on the tab. Then, another tactile vent from the rack hitting that tab. And then the final event from the interfacing of the alignment pin with the corresponding hole in the type cylinder. And you'll also find that, of course, the innermost keys will feel the heaviest compared to the outermost keys, and that's because you are pushing from a smaller radius, and it also has to compress the front two springs, so I guess there isn't really that much difference, though, of course, you will get a shallower feel than down here, where it will be the deepest. So it is a quite strange type and feel, but it is totally workable, though, yes, as you start typing a lot faster, then you might come to feel a lot more roughness, probably due to um, the rack and its edges starting to scratch against different parts as you move the mechanism too quickly. And then we can slide the carriage back in. Now, do note you have to start all the way from the right, make sure it's well seated, and that this edge over here fits into this ledge. And carefully slide, that will go in. Um, yeah, this machine also doesn't seem to have a, what do you call it, a paper release. Um, the main purpose of the paper release is to move the feed rollers out of the way so we can quickly remove the paper. In this case, I'm forced to roll it all the way. And keeping the paper release engaged also prevents the rubber rollers from flattening over time of disuse. And lastly, once you're done using the machine and you want to get it back into its case, you just roll it down here, like so. Then with the case, we see that we have these two latches that pretty much just pulls in said latches, which grab onto these thumb screws, and then you're ready to go. Carry this wherever you wish, and this is a pretty hefty machine. Um, let me get my food scale. <laughs> Right, it's right over here. Probably get a harder surface than this. With case about two point one kilograms. Um, or 
four pounds and ten ounces. About the case. So the case is about eight ounces. Yep, one point eight eight kilograms. And then compare that to the Blickenstrofer, which is quite the compact machine. Which is 2.5 kilograms, and that's without its case. So indeed, the Bandit is quite the portable machine, though of course hefty by modern standards. All right, so if you found this video interesting and are interested in learning about these old machines and how they work, feel free to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.